She's here with us today. Would you please welcome Laura Farmer? Well, good morning. What a wonderful church you guys have. You have an amazing pastor, awesome, awesome, awesome staff, wonderful worship team. Just kind of a moving and grooving church. <laughs> God is here. He's with you. See, you got to be careful of your reputation. It spreads. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And Laura and her husband are part of Mountain View Assembly. And you'll know Mountain View is the church that does the awesome walk through Bethlehem every year. And, and I was touched by the love of that congregation when Kim and I went through. And, and Laura and Brandon haven't been in town there long enough to have been a part of it. But I imagine that we'll see you guys out there the next time. Um, thank you for your willingness to come today. And what a powerful first service that we had. Uh, time is precious. And you're here for a reason, so let's jump into it. Okay. You were 16 and had an unexpected pregnancy. Talk us through your, your feelings, your thoughts, and your emotions. Well, it was tough. Um, I was young, naive, wild, um, without God, and really alone. Um, and so I was faced with some decisions. And where did you turn for help? <laughs> the phone book? Do you guys remember phone books? <laughs> we had to explain that first service to people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thumbed through it looking for help, and I came across two, two words called Planned Parenthood, and I thought, oh, wonderful, they're going to help me plan to be a parent. Oh, I was desperately, desperately, desperately wrong. And so you called and set up an appointment. Yes. What was that like? How did um, it go? Well, when I got there, they did a test and, of course, came back positive. And the first thing that one of the ladies said to me in the room that they took me in was, you're too young. Why, why would you want to ruin your life like this? Just, just take care of it. And what did you choose? I had an abortion um, at 16. And so they presented abortion as the answer to all your problems? And that uh, as the only answer. So as the only option. So they just told you that you're going to have an abortion and set it up? They didn't tell me. They suggested it, and I welcomed their suggestion. Mm -hmm. But there are no other suggestions? There are no, 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 no other, um, you know, we can put you in touch with someone or we can, no other option. And so it happened. Yes. Uh, your pregnancy was terminated and and your life was set free, supposedly. Isn't that what they promised? No. Tell it us. wasn't set free. What, tell us In what fact, happened. I went on a fast, rapid collision course. Um, I got into drugs, heavy drugs, um, drinking. I, I joked back then. I drank so much that I drank eight days a week, and there isn't even eight days in a week, to literally try to drown out my emotions. Mm. And I didn't care. I didn't care about anyone. I didn't care about anything. And so as often happens, one abortion ends, leads to another one. There yes. At 17, I got pregnant again. And I made the same decision. At this point, the first time you were, as you said, kind of naive. You didn't know what to expect. Uh, how did the two compare and contrast? What was it like doing it again? Well, when I was 16, um, Planned Parenthood sent me to a clinic that was about 40 miles from where we lived to an unmarked building. 
and it was substandard um, as far as appearance and just a dirty place. And um, I was awake, and I was sure that I was dying. And I begged for them to take me to the nearest hospital, and they refused. And two women held me down on each shoulder, and they kept me there until it was over. And so the second abortion that I had, I, I demanded that I be put to sleep. Um, and I was sent to, again, another unmarked building in a town about 40 miles from where I lived. Um, but this time it was of hosp hospital quality. It was clean. Um, and I was put to sleep. But several weeks following that clinic was bombed. How did that affect you? Deeply. Mm. Um, because I, you know, my thought was that could have been, or maybe that should have been me mm. that lost my life there. I, 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 I didn't want to live, honestly, at that point. You know, I find it kind of ironic that this procedure that's to give you your life back was also bringing despair. Yeah, yes. And then, so at 16, at 17, um, at 18, tell us about 18. Still on a major collision course. <laughs> major, destructive co collision course. I got pregnant again. But that one was a little different because I was 18. I was an adult and, you know, I thought I need to own up to this. And I, I need to go ahead and have this baby. But at about 23 weeks, I went into full-blown labor and delivered a stillborn baby, a little boy, mm -hmm. sweet little God teeny tiny but but perfect perfect fingers perfect toes just tiny Mini a miniature person mm. what did you see what what did that open your eyes to no i was wrong i i knew from that point that i had been lied to and and then my other two children were just the same, just as whole, and, and they were children. Is it common for people with prior abortions to miscarry? Is miscarriage, what's, is there a connection? Doctors may or may not admit that medically, but yes, because it causes a weakened cervix, so. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when they offer abortion, by take, can, you know, sometimes people are convinced that they can't take care of the child, don't want to take care of the child, or not able, they've had enough, or whatever the fears are. <clears throat> Those fears are exploited to convince them that termination is, is the option. But yet for many, um, they think that they're in control, that the illusion is I'm control of my body. I can decide when to deliver and when not to. But then sometimes, like Laura experienced, um, you don't always get to choose because prior actions sometimes create consequences that, um, that are destructive. And yet, as you held your baby, you, you saw something there, and it wasn't the a blob, a tissue, or, or some other life form, or whatever. I, I've heard people talk about they don't know what's in there, but yet I've never, I've, I've watched people become pregnant and deliver, and they're always human beings. It's never something else. Um, but yet, have you, if you've, have you ever looked at the development of a baby in the womb? Look at this. Day one is conception takes place. Seven days later, the tiny human implants in his mother's uterus. On the 10th day, um, 
the mother's body knows that there's something different and the menses stop. 18 days, the baby's heart begins to beat. At 21 days, it pumps his own blood through a separate closed circulatory system with his own blood type. It's a separate human being. 28 days, still before the ability to detect uh, a suspicion of pregnancy, the eye, the ears, and the respiratory system begin to form. 42 days, brain waves are recorded. The skeleton is complete. Reflexes, reflexes are present. Seven weeks, there have been photos of thumb sucking. At eight weeks, all the body systems are present. That's two months. At nine weeks, the baby is able to squint, swallow, move his tongue, or make a fist. At 11 weeks, there are spontaneous breathing movements, fingernails. All the body systems are working. At 16 weeks, the genital organs are clearly distinguished. The baby is able to grasp things with hands, swim, kick, turn, do somersaults, but still not able to be felt by its mother. At 18 weeks, the vocal cords work. He can cry. At 20 weeks, the lucky ones have hair on their heads, <laughs> weigh a pound, and are 12 inches long. At 23 weeks, there's a 15% chance of viability outside the womb. At 24 weeks, it goes to 56%. At 25 weeks, 79% of babies at this point survive premature birth. But yet, these are still in the range where they can be aborted. I remember one time going to a hospital, the neonatal unit, with someone's baby who was born prematurely, and he was there, and walking around and looking at babies, as small as, at that point, a pound 12 ounces, and recognizing that the only difference between this child and an aborted child is that he passed through the birth canal. And yet the ones that passed through the birth canal, here they were with little stuffed animals. They looked like, if you've, ever, if you've been on a farm and you've gone hunting, they looked like dress squirrels. They were that size. <laughs> but there was so much love and compassion, and yet the only difference was that they passed through the canal. And yet, as the Scripture says, um, in Psalm 139, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And from day one, from day one, a little girl is a little girl, and a little boy is a little boy. People can say what they want to say, but the reality is God knows, as we've said before, when God speaks, only his opinion counts. And what God said is true of you, it's true of me, it's true of every baby who's been born, and it's true of every baby who's been aborted. People expect, because they only see the physical, they expect identical twins to be the same in every aspect, but yet it's not the physical DNA that distinguishes the personhood. It's the breath of God. And God breathes life. And you recognized when you held that baby that God had created him. He had come from the hand of God. You said that you were someone far from God, but yet you recognized, you began to recognize that God was pursuing you. Tell us about that. I did. Um, at 20 years old, I um, met a wonderful man right there on the second row. He was stationed in California in the Air Force from Missouri. And we were dating, and he took me to his cousin's wedding in Missouri. We went on vacation from California to Missouri. And he comes from a family of very loving, um, God-fearing, God-serving people. They're pastors and, and, and servants of the Lord which was something that I didn't know and wasn't used to. And so we went to the wedding on Saturday, and then Sunday morning he took me to his home church um, in Missouri, and we were sitting on the back row, just he and I, and I heard this voice, and this voice said to me, I know you're hurt, 
and I know your pain. If you will come to me, I will heal you. And I looked around, and I knew it wasn't him because I knew his voice, so what was it? And that was in October. And from October until the next April, I sought that voice in my quiet time. I would say, who are you? And he would say, your savior. Who are you? Your help. Your hope. Your redeemer. The beginning and the end. The author and the finisher of your faith. But I still have that question, who are you? So in April, we started going to a church in California. We went one week, and then we went the second week visiting. And that second week, the pastor gave an altar call at the end of the service. And every word that the Spirit of God had spoken to me from October until April, that pastor said at the end of the service. And I finally was able to put it all together, that it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I gave my life to him and got saved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, you mentioned that you knew Brandon's voice, but he didn't know all of your pain. No. So even though you were experiencing healing from God, um, you didn't live happily ever after from that point. Tell us about how life moved forward from then. Well, since we're from two different states, um, and they're pretty far apart in mileage, he knew nothing about me. And so I kept it that way. We got married, and I kept my past a secret. Um, because at that point of our marriage, I was saved and serving God. Um, but it was hard. It was, it was hard to day after day after day press down those emotions, press down that pain, live unvictoriously because I wasn't living in full freedom. Um, and... Oddly, God had me working. We, li we actually moved to Missouri like a year and a half after we got married. Um, but I was actually working out of Irving, Texas. God, God has some strange ways of doing some things sometimes. So I would fly down um, to the Dallas airport f um, Sunday nights and fly back to Missouri on Friday evenings after I got off work. And um, one, one week of, that, of working down there one time, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and stay through the weekend. I want to check out the Dallas area because there's some really cool, just some neat things down there to see. Um, plenty of shopping. <laughs> Yes, one of the key takeaways for last service was to let them know that another word for shopping for guys is urban hiking. <clears throat> when you're in tow and... and... And I also said it's my love language. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. I like to shop, but that's, that's beside the fact. God had me there for another reason. It wasn't to be at the mall. It was actually um, we, a friend of mine and I that we, I worked with um, we decided to go to the Potter's House, which is Bishop T.D. Jakes' church. And um, we got there, and if you're familiar with it, I don't know if you've seen it on television, but this church is massive, um, like stadium size in number. We got into the lobby of the church, and a couple of women were there to greet us, and they brought us right up to the front. Welcome, team. Take note. That's how <laughs> it must have worked. <laughs> so how, how cool is that? It was like, how'd you know we were going to be here, you know? I guess God knew, right? So 
I had never heard um, any preaching done on abortion. A lot of pastors just don't, don't even go there. But that was the subject that Sunday. Mm. And God had you right in his crosshairs. And here I was, right on the front row. And at the end of that service, um, they said, we, we, our church is too large, is how they said it, to lay hands on everyone and pray for everyone. So if you would, if you've had an abortion, put, put one hand on your head and the other one on your stomach, we're going to pray over you. And of course, at first I'm like, there could be like 10,000 people looking at me right now, which is 20,000 eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but boldly, I, I did it because I, I needed to be freed from it. And so I received that prayer over me for healing in that area of my life. And yet and, there is more healing to come. Well, I got home from flying that, that week, that Friday night. And I knew it was time to finally confess to my husband of over three years what I had dealt with, what I was dealing with, and what I had done. Scripturally, it, the Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will cleanse us and purify us from unrighteousness. And yet there's another, there's not only a vertical aspect to healing, there is a horizontal, and that's in James 5.16. It says if we confess our sins to each other and pray for each other, uh, we'll be healed. There's a healing that comes through that prayer of the horizontal relationships. And the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And yet there's a risk. It's so neat and tidy if our, if our spiritual lives are only the vertical. It's where it gets scary a little more on the horizontal. And sometimes it's scary to come to God. Uh, some of you today are thinking, if God knew everything with all I've done, he couldn't accept me. And yet that's another one of the deceptions of, of the evil one. So when you started exploring the horizontal relationships, what, where did that go? Can I share a scripture really quick? It's, yeah, we like it's the Bible. A, I do too. I love the Bible. I love God's word. It's just the very beginning of Psalm 51. And when I was in the airport heading back to Missouri, I read, and this is out of the message, but generous in love. God, give grace. Huge in mercy. Wipe out my bad record. Scrub away my guilt and soak out my sin. And I prayed that. And then I went home. And I said, I have something to tell you. Now let me back up all the way back till I was two years old. My dad and mom got divorced. So, you know, sometimes when, when we go through life, we compare it to things we've been through. So I was a little afraid that when I confessed to my husband what I had done, that, that he would be mad or he would leave or whatever. But just the same way as Jesus hung on that cross with both arms outstretched, that's what my husband did. He, he put both arms outstretched, and he embraced me, and he said, I'll be here, and I'll walk through this with you, and I'll walk through this journey of healing with you. And that's what we've done. Mm -hmm. That's what we prayed, we, that God will allow us to do, isn't it? That they will know that we are his disciples by the way that we love. You had other friends, too. What, for those of us that have friends who have had abortions, how can we be a friend? How, what's the way to love them? How can we, how can we show Christ to, to others? You know, the biggest thing that I <laughs> lacked was just someone to listen to me. And so I think that we all need, for lack of a better term, we all need to be Jesus with skin on and just listen and love. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where 
If, you, you're, if you're afraid of judging, that's the point where you just listen. Uh, don't be afraid that by listening, you're condoning. Listening is opening up the avenue to healing and is providing the opportunity at the right moment to connect with Jesus. Jesus is the healer. He's the source of healing. And yet it's not going to be through your talking as much as your listening that's going to create those healing moments. Um, God blessed you with a family. Tell us about that. He did. My husband and I have three beautiful children. We have a 13-year-old son, a 9-year-old daughter, and a 2-year-old daughter. And those pregnancies weren't easy. Tell us about those. Well, my past damaged my body. That, that's just, to put it plain, that's just what happened. And basically, I don't have the strength within me to carry out a pregnancy to full term. Um, with our son, I went into preterm labor, and I had him six weeks early. And the little guy was in the NICU. I didn't even get to hold or even touch him for the first three days of his life. Um, when he was born, he was as blue as your chairs. And um, his doctor said to my husband and I, she said, you're very fortunate because we almost lost him through the night. So every, every one of your three pregnancies was difficult. Yes. Um, with <coughs> our middle daughter, I had to be on bed rest. And I was in preterm labor. I had her four weeks early. And then with our third baby, um, she, I would say that was the most difficult pregnancy because we had two kids at home. Um, I went into preterm labor at just 24 weeks with her. And from July until October, I had to be in bed and had to have surgery to even keep the pregnancy. Um, and my doctor actually wanted to put me in a hospital that was two hours from our home, and I begged him not, please don't send me to St. Louis because I, I want to be home with our other two children. So I stayed in bed, and it wasn't easy because... From July until October, I was literally in labor that whole time. Can you imagine? <laughs> you don't want to imagine, do you? It was <clears throat> awful. Do you see the other part of the deception? Deception says abortion gives you control of your body. That by having an abortion, you can decide when to bear children and when not to. And yet what I hear is that the part that they don't talk about is that you forever give up. You give up some things. That God is good. He's good all the time. And he's the healer. And he, sa he brings um, peace. And he brings healing. And he brought blessing. But yet every one of those pregnancies was difficult um, because of the promises that were unfulfilled through the, the abortions. <clears throat> Why? is ministering to people now so important to you? Why, why would you be willing to get up in front of a lot of people that you don't know and talk about this? It is hard. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's tough to just sit up here and be an open book. But um, truthfully, it's so that maybe just one or two or many don't have to keep suffering in silence like I did. It's so that you know that there's hope. It's so that you know that there's healing. 